Welcome to Music Niagara's At Home Remembrance Day performance. I'm Guy Bannerman. You may remember me from Beethoven's Hair earlier this season. I'm grateful during these difficult times that we can bring live performance right into the safety and comfort of your home. Today I'm joining Addis Bankus, the founder and artistic director of Music Niagara, and also St. Mark's music director, James Bourne, in a special program paying tribute to the First Nations, Métis, and Innu people of Canada who have a long and proud tradition of military service to our country. Today, your donations to Music Niagara, November 11th, will go directly to the Last Post Fund Indigenous Initiative, a new program that I urge you to consult on their website. The Last Post Fund, as you know, will find uh, unmarked graves of fallen soldiers and remedy the situation, and this new initiative does it particularly for indigenous warriors. So please consider a donation to them, and again, on November 11th, any donation made to Music Niagara will go directly to the last post fund. Thanks. Oh, just a note before I begin. Today you'll hear often in my reading a word that I'm happy to say is becoming more and more uncomfortable, and that is the word Indian to refer to indigenous people. But because I'm working with historical documents and certainly government departments and so on, it has a bit of a technical designation in the reading. So uh, please understand that I am following the history of 100 years ago rather than the usages of the present. In 1917, a mother from the Oneida settlement outside of London, Ontario, proudly stated that she had given four of her boys to fight for England. She had three sons fighting on the Western Front, and the fourth, who enlisted at age 15, was discovered as underage in England, but was held back for training at Whitley Camp. All had originally enlisted in the 114th Battalion, known as the Indian Unit. Her fifth son successfully enlisted at 14 years of age in 1917, but was released at Halifax prior to embarkation. The enthusiasm for the war effort among Indians was evident on the home front and was felt by women as well as men. Indian women served as nurses and were active in patriotic organizations. For example, Edith Montour of the Six Nations Reserve served as a nurse with the US Medical Corps by 1917, she was stationed in Vittel, France, treating wounded soldiers. Sometimes we would just walk right over to where there had been fighting, she said. It was an awful sight, whole towns blown up. Indian women also formed patriotic and Red Cross societies on their reserves. They made bandages, knitted various items of clothing and raised funds by selling traditional crafts. The Canadian Red Cross Society stated that the articles made by Indian women were the finest quality of knitting and sewing they received. The Six Nations Women's Patriotic League, formed in October 1914, produced the greatest yield of needlework of any reserve. In early November, the Council Chiefs granted the League $50 to purchase supplies, and the local patriotic organization in Brantford gave them $15 worth of yarn. This league will do the Indian women good this winter. They could easily knit one or two hundred dollars worth of yarn. They can do the work, but they cannot get the money, and there is prejudice against working through the white people. On the 22nd of November, the Brantford Expositor, the local paper, celebrated the league's first shipment of 100 pairs of socks and mitts and 100 toques. Thank you. 
Many recruiters and battalion commanders believed that, given the historical background of Indian culture and military prowess, they had innate abilities to track, scout, and shoot, while also possessing a certain degree of bloodlust. In addition, many believed that Indians had keener eyesight, especially night vision, had better hearing, and could navigate based on instinct. In reality, many Indians filled the roles of snipers and scouts and excelled at both functions given their civilian experience as hunters and trappers. It might also be reasonably assumed that during training, Indian marksmanship was inimitable on the rifle range. All 35 Ojibwa recruited from Fort William in northern Ontario became snipers. And many Indians also did practice traditional customs. Many wore moccasins, especially snipers and scouts, as they were quieter than boots. Others, like George Strangling Wolf, adhered to the ancient beliefs of the warrior ethos. A custom in the life of a warrior on the eve of battle was to cut away a small portion of his body as an offering. So in those dark days of 1917, George Strangling Wolf, while praying, took a needle out of his housewife, a soldier's name for a sewing kit, and inserted it into the skin near his knee. He then took an army knife and sliced off that portion of the flesh which he was holding out taut with the needle. Pointing in the direction of the sun and still holding the small portion of bloody flesh in his hand, George offered prayer. Corporal Francis Pagama Gabo, who held the top numbers as a sharpshooter, also held an ardent belief in Indian customs and the supernatural. When he was at Rossport on Lake Superior in 1914, he and some other soldiers landed from their vessel to gather blueberries near an Ojibwa camp. An old Indian recognized him and gave him a tiny medicine bag to protect him, saying he would shortly go into great danger. The bag was of skin, tightly bound with a leather thong. Sometimes it seemed to be hard as a rock. At other times, it appeared to contain nothing. What was really inside, he never knew. But he wore it in the trenches and survived the war. And there are countless records of Indian soldiers bellowing war chants and whoops. Mike Mountain Horse once let out a yell he had been saving for years, and it was a genuine war hoop. He said he released all his pent-up feelings in the rendering of his own particular war song, after which some of his companions assured him that he had stopped the war, at least for a few seconds. On another occasion, Mike Mountain Horse even went so far as to paint Blackfoot Confederacy victory symbols on the captured guns of an entire German battery during the Battle of Amiens perhaps an indication that he felt he was fighting for his blood nation and the Confederacy rather than for Canada.
In July 1916, a report of the number two military district revealed that the 114th Battalion, the so-called Indian Unit, had 348 Indians, including five officers. Given the lower than expected recruitment rates, an all Indian battalion was untenable. In all, 353 Indians, 287 from the Six Nations Reserve, served in the 114th Battalion. A 35-man regimental band, all from the Six Nations, was also formed. The band toured the British Isles for recruiting and patriotic purposes and included traditional garments and war dances in their performances. Although only two companies were composed of Indians, special concessions were asked for by the commanding officer on the 25th of March, 1916. This battalion is recruiting largely from the Six Nation Indians. Already more than 200 of them have enlisted and I confidently expect 350 to 400 more. The ancestors of these men fought for Great Britain in every battle on the Niagara frontier in the War of 1812 and were with General Brock in large numbers when he fell at Queenston Heights. To this day, they venerate his memory and the name for which I ask, Brock's Rangers, would greatly add to our prestige with them and gratify them exceedingly. The white half of the battalion comes from Haldimand County, one of the Niagara Peninsula group, and many of these men too had ancestors with Brock in 1812. Permission was granted to use the name Brock's Rangers two days later. The regimental crest featured two crossed tomahawks below the motto for King and Country. The crest also bore the name Brock's Rangers and a crown, all superimposed on a maple leaf. The Six Nations Women's Patriotic League embroidered a 114th Battalion flag, which they adorned with Iroquoian symbols. Duncan Campbell Scott, bureaucrat and poet, through his influential position as Deputy Superintendent General of Indian Affairs from 1913 to 1932, was the driving force behind the propagation of paternalistic and assimilationist policies. As he declared, I want to get rid of the Indian problem. Our objective is to continue until there is not a single Indian in Canada that has not been absorbed into the body politic and there is no Indian question and no Indian department. He was also the most influential government official regulating Indians and the war ever, and he dominated all aspects of their military service. Following official sanction to enlist Indians in December 1915, Scott, in keeping with contemporary political and social conventions, viewed military service as a convenient windfall to his program of assimilation. These men, who have been broadened by contact with the outside world and its affairs, who have mingled with the men of other races, and who have witnessed the many wonders and advantages of civilization, will not be content to return to their old Indian mode of life. And thus the war will have hastened that day, the millennium of those engaged in Indian work, when all the quaint old customs the weird and picaresque ceremonies, the sun dance and the potlatch, and even the musical and poetic native languages shall be as obsolete as the buffalo and the tomahawk, and the last teepee of the northern wilds give place to a model farmhouse. In other words, the Indian shall become one with his neighbor in his speech, life, and habits, thus conforming to that worldwide tendency towards universal standardization which would appear to be the essential underlying purport of all modern social evolution. With the initiation of hostilities, Scott, in a view shared by the majority of British and Canadian politicians and senior commanders, believed that the war will be over by Christmas. Thank you.
to war casualties, the 1918-1919 Spanish influenza pandemic devastated indigenous populations, more so than those of their white counterparts. The drastically lower socioeconomic standing of Canada's indigenous peoples, their lack of accessibility to health care, and their well-documented susceptibility to old world diseases, most notably tuberculosis, were all factors in the higher proportion of sickness and deaths due to the influenza virus. Although global death figures are estimates, recent research concludes that roughly 50 million people died worldwide of the Spanish influenza, compared to a total 10 million war service deaths, or 16 million war-related deaths, including civilian fatalities. Influenza affected one in six Canadians, resulting in more than 50,000 deaths nationwide, 0.62% of the population. By comparison, an estimated 3,500 status Indians died of the disease, 3% of the total Indian population. The Indian death rate was five times higher than the rest of Canada, while tuberculosis rates were 20 times higher than for Euro-Canadians. After the war, the Government of Canada introduced financial and farmland grant programs for veterans. The first and largest of these initiatives was the Soldier Settlement Act of 1919. The SSA provided veterans the opportunity to obtain Dominion lands at no cost or to purchase farms and equipment at low interest rates. 
Essentially, Indians were privy to all benefits of the SSA on par with all other veterans. The act specified, however, that the Department of Indian Affairs was charged with the administration of all benefits, allowances, and pensions for Indians, thus avoiding the confusion which would inevitably arise if their affairs were administered partly by the Department of Indian Affairs and partly by the Soldier Settlement Board. Although the amendments gave Duncan Campbell Scott all powers of the Soldier Settlement Board except those of expropriation, applications by Indian veterans were subject to the approval of their individual Indian agents, who have personal knowledge of the capabilities and needs of Indian returned soldiers. Corporal Francis Pagama Gabo returned to his Perry Island Reserve in April 1919 after having served as long as any Canadian soldier of the Great War. In the summer of 1919, he met numerous times with his Indian agent, Alexander Logan, to apply for a farming loan under the Soldier Settlement Act. He needed Logan's approval for the loan, and each application Pagama Gabo submitted was refused. Logan remarked that Pagama Gabo was disabled and he suffered from dementia and his site chosen was the most out of the way place for a successful farmer. Although Pagama Gabo wrote directly to Indian Affairs and to the Soldiers Aid Commission, he received no land, loans or grants under the SSA. Certainly not just recompense for a three-time military medal winner. In May 1919, Duncan Campbell Scott issued all agents with a six-page guide pertaining to Indians, the SSA, and the duties and power of an agent, stressing that it must be borne in mind that loans will be made only to such returned soldiers as have experience in farming or are likely to make success of farming operations. A resentful Corporal Pagama Gabo had to ask his agent, John Daly, to release his veteran funds in periodic allotments, despite the fact that he was short of money and supporting a wife and six children. After more than four years at war, and having been awarded three military medals and tallying 378 unofficial kills, Pagama Gabo was still, after all, an Indian. In fact, the government used the SSA to expropriate reserve land. Eastern European immigrants who came in large numbers at the turn of the century had been granted most of the fertile crown land in the prairies. Suitable farmland was required to meet the promises of the SSA. An order in council granted the Department of Indian Affairs the authority to expropriate reserve land not under cultivation or otherwise properly used without the consent of the Indians or their councils. Almost 86,000 acres of reserve land was confiscated and given to white veterans. Due to these circumstances, land claims are ongoing in British Columbia and Alberta. After petitioning the government, most bands settled for monetary sums which were usually equivalent to fair market value. However, even the 1.10 million that was awarded to the Indians was not given directly to the bands, rather it was held in trust by the Department of Indian Affairs, which promised to disperse the money to the various reserves when it saw fit. While Indian soldiers were not excluded from national honor rolls or monuments, such as the Menin Gate in Ypres or the Vimy Memorial in France, Explicit governmental recognition was slower and bestowed only in the last two decades of the 20th century. On the 21st of June, 2001, on Canadian National Aboriginal Day, the government unveiled the National Aboriginal Veterans Monument in Confederation Park in Ottawa. Schools, military bases, statues, and other landmarks honor select Indian soldiers by bearing their names. For example, in 2006, the headquarters for the 3rd Canadian Ranger Patrol Group was renamed after Pagamagabo. The honors now bestowed upon Indian veterans are worthy representations of the sacrifices they made in service of King and Kanata during both world wars. 
Indians continue their long-standing tradition of military service. Currently, over 1,300 indigenous Canadians are serving in the Canadian forces. 2006 census recorded a significantly growing indigenous population of 1.2 million, with 47% of that population under the age of 25. Certainly, members of this increasing population will continue to serve as they have done in the past, both their nations and Canada, in our shared Canadian forces. <laughs>